No person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. These 37 words constitute Title IX of the Education Amendments Act. Signed into law by President Nixon on June 23, 1972, just over 50 years ago, Though not specifically written about sports, this landmark le legislation ushered in a new era of women's sports participation. We have gathered here tonight for a Title IX roundtable brought to you by Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission. Our goal is to discuss the ways Title IX has improved lives, how it has fallen short, visibility of women's sports through media and sports brands, and hopes for the future. The goal is to educate some of our viewers, but more importantly, to let them hear from experts <laughs> that are here at the forefront of parity and change. We are coming to you live from Portland State University's Lincoln Hall. I am your host, Shannon Robry, three-time Olympic track athlete. With us at the round table, we have PSU legend, Terry Mariani, former PSU athlete, coach, and administrator, Chelsea Gregg, PSU's basketball, women's basketball head coach, Sydney Obilovich, PSU's soccer goalkeeper, and we have John Johnson, PSU athletic, uh, athletic director. So without further ado, let us begin. No person better embodies the range of women's sports experience than you, Terry. You're a true PSU legend. And in your time at PSU, you competed in three sports. You're a coach, the winning, win, winningest coach of uh, PSU history and a senior women's administrator before retiring in 2008. When Title IX went into effect, you were an athlete at PSU. Can you give us a little bit of that history? Uh, well, unbelievable for a lot of people when I tell stories, because they think, you're crazy. You did that or you didn't do that? Um, yeah, we didn't have facilities like uh, the opportunity that the current student-athletes have, um, even opportunities to participate in sports. So at Portland State, for example, it was like a glorified intramural program versus an intercollegiate athletic program. Uh, we had to set up our own chairs. We didn't have scoreboards. We had to flip cards. We had stopwatches for clocks. Um, we didn't have access to the training room without a trainer putting a paper bag over our head and leading us through the men's locker room. And, um, you know, I've always told people I was very happy. At least it wasn't a plastic bag. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was just... <laughs> And, and people hear those stories and they say, why did you put up with that? And I know it sounds phenomenal now, but for us, we were just so excited to have a chance to participate and, and get that opportunity. And, you know, now, today, participating in sports for, for you know, all, the, all of the athletes, it's as natural as the air they breathe. So um, it, it was tough times, but we didn't look at it as tough times because it was just so exciting for us. Yeah, you spoke about, um, you had said that there was, I think your sophomore year at Portland State in 1971, when your volleyball team qualified for the national tournament, it was both this exciting moment and challenging moment. Can you share a little bit more about that experience? Well, we won the regional tournament and qualified for the national tournament, which was in Florida. Couldn't be further away, right? <laughs> and, uh, and we weren't part of the athletic program at that time. It was under the physical education department. Uh, they didn't have a budget uh, to send us, uh, and they said you'll have to raise the money. Well, we didn't. We only had two and a half weeks to get that much money raised, but we did everything we could. In those days, other than your usual cake walks and cookie bakes, um, you know, we we kind of got a little bit more original. We gave tours of funeral homes. We gave tours of um, uh, different uh, cheese and cracker places. Um, and, and we went out to the airport and washed airplanes, uh, but we, we weren't able to raise enough money and didn't get to go. And you went on to become a, both a coach and a senior women's administrator. At, at a time as Title IX was coming um, into, it, it existed and strategy was trying to be created. And how did you then, how did your experience change or how did you take that experience as an athlete into your role as a coach and administrator? Well, did everything we could to try to um, help the administration 
uh, increased the opportunities for uh, athletics, had a very supportive administration once we got under the, the direction of athletics. Um, and, and they were very supportive, but you know, it had to go in slow progress. Um, you can't just turn around and, and even everything out overnight, but um, progress was, was being made. And, and to me, that was what was important mm -hmm. um, to know that you know, your scholarship allotment, for example, you know, would, would increase every year instead of just increasing the male sports and not increasing the women's sports. So um, just trying to help them with the checks and balances. Mm -hmm. But also at the same time, for me, one of the things that was important to me as a coach was to make sure my current athletes knew the history mm -hmm. and, and knew, you know, people came before them to give them those opportunities because they forget. They just think it's, you know, like now, mm -hmm. I think the only reason why a lot of current student athletes have heard of Title IX mm -hmm. is because it's the 50th year, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we're starting to take some things for granted and we're, we're still not where we really want to be, mm -hmm. but we've made a ton of progress. But it was important to me that they, they remember the history too. Yeah, you said every about, about every five years you like to give a little history lesson. <laughs> yep, they kind of got tired of it, but, <laughs> but that was kind of the point. I didn't want them to forget. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Totally. So. Now, Sydney, you are a current athlete here at PSU. So 50, 50 years later, we'd love to hear about your experience uh, competing for PSU in 2023. Honestly, it's been really awesome so far. Um, I came in as a transfer um, my sophomore year, and I came into nothing but open arms, and my team has been amazing. My coaches have just taken me in, and the environment has just been phenomenal. Um, I'm from Portland, so this is kind of like my backyard, um, and I get to play in front of like my parents and my friends and family from home, so it's just been like amazing, a uh, great experience, something that I definitely like want to show other athletes that being a student athlete can be really challenging but it can be really fun too and exciting at the same time and as I'm going into my senior year I want to be able to take in the freshmen and kind of show them that you know like it's going to be scary but like you can do it <laughs> um but it's been really awesome um, I love it and I love the other athletes and the experience is great you said you, when you transferred into PSU, you came in with a vision for the team and you shared that with us before coming here tonight that you had talked with your teammates about this event. You know, that, what was that vision that you brought for the team and sort of how have you been a leader? What conversations have you had about current state of PSU and, and what you want it to be? Yeah, um, Title IX has definitely been a topic of conversation um, amongst my team at least. Um, and it's something that we take very seriously. Um, honestly, we get frustrated over little things, but we try not to let it like shake us. Uh, honestly, I don't know. I just, I think it's just a great a spot with the. I know, I know. Um, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> like, oh. But um, no, it really is something that we take seriously. And it's something that I feel like a lot of people should talk about more because. I feel like it has kind of um, drifted past. And as a female in sports, um, I just want the best for my team and other athletes that are coming into the like the sports world. And um, yeah, so I think continuing to talk about it, like you said, every five years is really important just because coming into college, I didn't really know much about Title IX. And my coaches have kind of mentioned it and it's been mentioned more with like my team and how it's affected us, but it's something that we notice every day, whether we're like playing sports or not. When, for all of you, for everyone here, when you heard Terry's stories or when you hear Sydney speak, is there anything that surprises you or stands out to you or resonates with you? Well, I'm just excited that, <laughs> that you know, she, she ha has talked about Title IX with her team and has kept that story alive because um, for us oldies, that, that means a lot because, uh, you know, and there were people even before me, believe it or not, um, <laughs> that uh, opened the doors for my, for my opportunity, had the, had the chance uh, uh, 
John will tell you, my 91 softball team got just got inducted into the Portland State mm -hmm. Hall of Fame and had a chance to get my 91 team together with the current softball team. And um, the current team was asking them a lot of questions. And one of the questions, what things do you think have changed? And one of, one of my players said, well, you get to fly everywhere you go. We drove <laughs> 12 passenger vans and would drive 18 straight hours to get where we're going. But, but on the same thought, though, she said, but we wouldn't have changed a thing because the bonding, that's why that group was so close. So there's pros and cons, you know, to, to new things. But yeah, travel has definitely changed. You know, we had four in a room, two yeah. to a bed. And yeah. it was, you know, stayed at Motel 6 and they fought over who got the bed with the quarter massage. Yeah, just little things <laughs> like that. But uh, they had a much, you know, good, strong appreciation for what they got. Yeah. And I think that's, again, what I hope today's athletes have that appreciation, Sid, it sounds like you do. We, we actually had a conversation with our coach the other day, and she was saying her, experiment, or her experience at Sac State, um, when she was coaching, she could only give the girls, like, two cotton shirts, and they would have to buy their own socks. And she kind of asked us, um, like, what did you guys get? Like, you guys got super nice dry fits, you guys got super nice um, socks, shoes, all that. And so... Um, but she said the same thing and she said, but you know what, like we didn't care if they were cotton, if they were dry fit, like what they were, as long as like we could step on the field and play, like that's all we wanted to do. So that was really cool. Yeah. It's interesting that, um, uh, the stories about the, the road trips I played and back when I played, you know, we bus too, you know, and go from Cheney to Pocatel. Yeah. Well, well, it's a lot of vans to move a football team. But uh, there's not enough drivers. <laughs> but uh, those were great times, actually. And uh, we talk about today that's, you know, which has all been positive with uh, yeah, treating our student athletes better and don't miss as much school, et cetera. But, you know, you'd stop at a truck stop and, you know, you got your $5 or $4, whatever you got to go get something to eat after the game. And, get back on the bus and I mean that, that was such that was so Americana and so iconic in some ways I think we missed that a little bit that you know appreciation for what we have and and relative to Title IX I think I, I really applaud the conference offices in the NCA but particularly the conference offices in the athletic programs that are moving that and communicating that and telling the stories about Title IX and what it has done, because it's also helped ma male programs as well, not just female programs. And, uh, but of course, uh, the importance is there, but it, it's really interesting that, you know, there's more interest in my children who are much younger. Dad, what is Title IX? You know, so you get to tell the story about their aunts and the play GAA and and uh, so sports were important in our family, even though it wasn't as organized, but everyone participated. And, uh, and, you know, back then it was different in high school, but my oldest sisters went to Washington State and became in the rec department, tried out for sports, uh, uh, and uh, became members of the team before it was organized. So that was like even pre-Terry. And uh, so they still have fond memories about that. And just the, the good things that athletics teaches us mm -hmm. and the camaraderie and being part of it, it, the environment is as important as the togetherness. Yeah. And we talk about COVID and all that and people being a part, and I think we all miss that. Yeah. And I think it's even more important now. Yeah. And yeah. athletics has brought people together. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, Chelsea, as a collegiate athlete in the 2000s, your experience is sort of nestled in between what I like to think of as Terry's sort of first wave of Title IX experience and Sydney's kind of third wave of Title IX that she's living now. So talk to us about being or growing up in sports in the 80s and 90s and your your role models and your evolution into coaching. Yeah, you know, I think that before I get there, what, what stood out to me when Terry was speaking was just the opportunity to play postseason and then not getting to go. Um, I can't imagine just having your athletes work so hard and prepare and, and compete so hard, and, and that's the goal. Everybody wants to play postseason. That's what you work for. 
um, to not have the opportunity is like crushing. So I can imagine, you know, having having that situation. So um, I think that's a good story for our, for our team to hear as well, because I think sometimes maybe similar to Sydney, we get caught up in the details and just are frustrated with the daily. But the reality is we have it so good. Um, and that doesn't take away from the progress that we want to continue to make. Um, but I think to remember and to understand how it used to be is really important for us to see and gain perspective. I think for myself, um, growing up, I just had opportunity to, to play sports and just didn't know any different. Mm-hmm. Um, on the women's side, when I played soccer and basketball, it was me and him. Mm-hmm. Then the women's national team was really, you know, the team that I was looking at growing up. Um, and then basketball, WNBA wasn't quite going yet. And so it was more some college athletics, but Michael Jordan was the guy, you know, he was the one that I really lived up to and, and wanted to model your game after and, you know, all that. But I think this was really fortunate in this second wave is that um, maybe it's how the parents raised me and afforded me these opportunities to be able to compete, but it wasn't a second thought to not be able to do that, whether it was middle school, high school, or even college. Um, I think it you started to see some difference once you got to college and you could see well, the men's programs are maybe doing this, and maybe there's some differences between the men's side and the women's side, and so we start to see that. But I always had coaches that, you know, saw that, continued to fight for us, but the reality was is we have to control what we can control for, um, and we can continue to be to advocate. Um, but really, like Terry said, sometimes it's that slow progress, and so you can just continue to compete, put a great product on the floor, um, and just really be thankful for the opportunity. Yeah. And when we look at the current state of coaching, um, so some stats, women comprise approximately 43% of head coaches for women's teams and approximately 4% of head coaches for men's teams. You're not only a coach, but you're also a mother. So when it comes to those role models in that space, there's even the numbers are much, much smaller. Um, And yet you have a proven record of success, uh, including uh, recently pulling off your upset at the Big Sky Conference. So, you know, (laughs) so I would love as a fellow mother um, in sports, I would love for you to to talk to us about your experience um, kind of navigating this new space. Yeah. Like you said, it is new. <laughs> um, I think growing up, I had female role models within the coaching world who I played for, but they didn't have families, they, either by choice or, or not, but they didn't have families or they were young coaches. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know that I saw that role modeled where these strong females, um, they were in education, they were teachers, they were doing these things, and they were doing that very well and having families. But on the coaching side, especially um, in collegiate sport, I didn't see that so much. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I feel really honored to be able to ha- to hold this space and really thankful for the opportunity. Um, and I, I hope that it's a, a role model for our student athletes, that you don't have to choose, that you can pick. You can be a career and you can be a mom. You can have a family. You can do both. Um, and there's space and room for that. Um, it's not easy mm-hmm. and it's going to take a village. And we're really thankful that we have family uh, supports and nanny and a, a supportive administration that allows us to make that work. Mm-hmm. Um, support a partner, all those things. But I think in this space, I have to even remind myself because I've been afforded these opportunities um, and thankful for those that were trailblazers before me, um, just perspective, yeah. right? That I've always been in sport. That's always been a part of my life since I was like four years old. It's always been something I've been involved with. Um, but I just think being a mom has been a new perspective uh, overall and and have always been about uh, empowering our female athletes and even more so now just whatever they want to do, whether it's career, like I said, family, um, and just a reminding the perspective. Mm-hmm. And you had said when we were talking, you know, this idea of as as uh, collegiate athletes like yourself or myself go into then the next phase of uh, sports after college um, and, you know, around this topic of motherhood, I, I loved what you had said about um, what's the expectation, right? Like, you know, looking at the way that the space is structured and you know, maybe taking a pause and taking a step back and saying just because it worked that way always, is that the way that it should continue to work moving forward? And so um, you had also shared a moment kind of of reflection with your team and gratitude giving. I would love it if you're willing to share kind of the things you do in your team to, um, you know, to reframe or to to kind of help usher in a, a new way of thinking about um leadership in this space yeah I you know I think that we had a really challenging year last year and so we always even this year we want to focus on 
the process and, and on us again. It's not about wins and losses. Of course, we're competitive and we we want to get those W's. But how do we get there is more important and building that foundation in our culture. And so something we do um, after every practice and our games, we either do shout outs to our teams or we do like a well, better how. Um, and, and going into the tournament, we did shout outs. And so each player, we went around in our, our huddle and just picked somebody across from us and shared what we appreciate about them. Um, in that space and then we did that with our coaches as well and it happened that uh my partner is also on staff mm -hmm. um he's my associate head coach and we've been on staff with each other now for eight years uh as assistants colleagues before now myself as a head coach and um it was just really thoughtful and i appreciate it in the space in front of our team just to share um how much he appreciated uh the strong woman the leadership mm -hmm. and the ability to do both or all of it, right? With being a mom, being able to be a mentor, a head coach in that space. Um, and even with the female head coaches in our department, being able to share those experiences that we maybe didn't really see, you know, earlier on. And so that's been a really neat thing for us to do. I love that. What about the rest of the group? Are there ways that you, you know, in your team environments have tried to celebrate those successes or reflect or be better? You know, the mental tricks of an athlete that you kind of, used to bring up in, in, either the individual or the group as a whole. Do you have any? We kind of did the same thing is um, after practice, we would kind of just be in our circle stretch or whatever it was. And we would kind of just talk about um, what we did well at practice, where we would like shout out people that kind of stood out to us. Um, and then before practice, we'll usually huddle up and either say what we're grateful for or we'll say what we're going to work on that day. And I think that's like a really good time to just have our minds be focused on one thing and not have us be everywhere. And it's really awesome because that's just a second for us to just be together and focus on what was important and the positive things. It's very easy to go to negative things. Um, so it's been, it's been really helpful within our team. So that was really cool you said that because we did that too. <laughs> Shout out Julie Jones. <laughs> Shout out Julie Jones. Yeah, sports performance. She's been huge for us. Yeah, I just want I I can't say enough of how Chelsea is with her team and her players because um, it's, you know, I have opportunities to interview her all during the season and listening to those types of stories and, and how she relates to her team and does these kinds of things. And then they have a, I forget what it is, where you, you focus every game there's a, Oh, a strong woman in the community or across the nation. Yep. Is yeah. it shine, shine the light, light. Shine, shine the light, shine where, she, where her players research somebody and then they focus and um, attract people to who this person is, those kinds of things. So she's, she's teaching them at the same time of skills outside of basketball, which is so important as a coach and just how she does it. Uh, if there are young coaches out there. This is the woman you want to to contact and epitomize and and learn from because um, I'm just very proud of what she has done. Thank you. How about you and your team experience of you know or or leadership experiences? No, but I think it's so important. You know, I think uh, 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 with the senior staff and my staff, you know, I'm always available and you always go and talk to them. Uh, don't sit in my office and. You know, you have to knock to get in. I'm not that way. And at the end of the day, so we'll see you later. They all, we all touch base. And I said, did we get better today? And they said, yeah, we did, John. I said, great. We're all trying to get a little bit better. And um, I think it's about team. You got to, you know, it's it, athletics is hard sometimes. And at the administrative level, you don't get many wins. No. Uh, uh, you live them through the young people and the coaches and those few times, but most of the time you're battling and how do we get better? How do we give our kids more? How do we get more resources? How do we sell one more ticket? How do we make this area better? And so always trying to get better. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, I think leadership's about, you know, being positive. Mm -hmm. uh, athletics is hard. Uh, it's um, the most important important, unimportant thing in our society. <laughs> and it's not world hunger. Mm. At the end of the day, what we're trying to do is teach lessons, mm -hmm. uh, uh, have a, our student athletes, I hope, have a great experience as a student athlete. And uh, 
I, I kind of fell into athletic administration. You know, I was a business major, played football, and then I was going to move on. And then kind of Ron Raver, God rest his soul, kind of kept pushing me. And I met Terry when I was just a little puppy, just starting out. Uh, and she was on. more gray hair yeah. than I do. Well, I had more gray hair than her when I played. So uh, anyway, but I wouldn't trade it for the world because I've never worked a day in my life. Not that I haven't had hard days. They've been hard days. And uh, I think leadership is setting an example. Uh, you got to have fun because if you don't have fun, it isn't worth it. I don't care what level you're at. You got to have some fun because life's too short. Now, mm -hmm. follow up one point, if you don't mind. Please. What um, JJ said, talked about perfection and, you know, meeting with his staff. Are we better? Did we do one thing today that made us a little bit better? Did that with my team. Did that with my staff when I was AD. And that's one of the things that I think Chelsea does too so well with her team. Is you always you hear perfection way too much, and it's not that we want to strive for perfection. We want to strive for of being better every day. And if that's the focus, then you are going to get the Ws and you are going to get the results you want. So get away from being perfect, because we're never going to achieve perfection. You might have that one game where everything happens for you, but it doesn't happen all the time. Mm -hmm. And then also, you know, relying on each other. Um, you know, it is, coaching's this way too, but at athletic administration even more so. I used to have, I used to rate my days one, two, or three. One was great, two was okay, I got through it, and three was awful. And my goal wasn't to get more ones, but it was to get rid of the threes, uh. you know. So, um, and, and that's the way sometimes as an athlete, you know, as, you know, you're going to have some days where something's tough in school and, you know, my practice might not be as great as I want it to be, but I don't want any three days, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So get away from perfection yeah. and work on being better today than we were yesterday as a staff, as a staff, as a student athlete, and as a team. Enjoy the journey. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Embrace the journey. You said something um, about, like, leadership is about being positive and I think coming in as a student athlete you know it's going to be very difficult and really draining but you don't really realize like how mentally hard it can be and there's definitely days where yeah you have like those threes and there are days where sometimes your head you'll just be very negative and so being positive is something that like our team has really touched on because it makes the sport so much more enjoyable and like you said um if you're not having fun like why are you there like you're we signed up to play the sport we loved or love and we we want to be there still playing the sport we love not just because we have to be there or just because we have a scholarship or whatever it is um it's really important to focus on having fun and like being positive because if it's this negative environment nobody's gonna want to be there i love what you had said as well like this the process mindset rather than the outcome focus um and I think that, you know, you had made a comment about um, it's the most, like, unimportant, important thing or important, unimportant yeah. thing. But, like, really sport is this sort of um, concentration of human experience in these, like, in these little games, in these moments, this real self, self-awareness and self-reflection. And, um, and so I think that, you know, that's why sport is important because it teaches us about ourselves and each other. And... You know, I wanted to, when we spoke before, you had shared a little bit about your start of your administrative career. In 1985, you began um, as an assistant athletic director at Eastern Washington University. And shortly after you took that role, uh, a pivotal case went through the Washington State Supreme Court. Um, in 1987, the Blair decision held that football should not have been excluded from trial courts calculations for participation opportunities scholarships and distribution of non-revenue funds and based on that Blair decision Washington legislature became the first state in the union to legislate athletics you served on a panel tasked with codifying how football would be calculated it's something that uh, I I get the impression you are and should be very proud of and I'd love for you to share that yeah. experience yeah well the pioneers and and Terry knows them uh, Marcia St. Holtz yeah. Joe Washburn at Washington State. It was a case at Washington State University mm -hmm. uh, where they had two separate programs, as many of them did. You had women's athletics and men's athletics. And uh, they'd passed the 
the state of Washington passed that we're going to have gender equity, equitable numbers, K through college, not just sports, K through college. So from uh, grade school, junior high, et cetera, et cetera. So they pass the law, and of course, they never tell you how to do it. Right. right. <laughs> so then all of us went. They had a representative from the junior colleges, each of the four year schools, uh, high school association, and we're in Olympia. And they sit down, and I walk in the room. Not that it's a bad thing because I have five sisters, I was the only male. Yeah. Plus, I played football, <laughs> right? So all of a sudden, nobody would sit and eat lunch with me. But uh, I'm joking. I'm joking. Some things but, haven't changed, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. They still You're don't. the only male here. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's yeah. right. So, yeah. Good thing for those sisters. Though. Yeah, I, know. I was prepared. <laughs> but uh, it was wonderful because at the time there was much discussion. Terry will know this. Do you count football at every body? Or remember they used 75. 75. And so I'm in there, and, and uh, the first state in the union to legislate gender equity in sport, K through, like kindergarten all the way through. So um, sitting there and they're saying, well, you know, my ID says 75 and 75 seems like a good number and I'm sitting there mm -hmm. and it's about counting and when you count them and I raise my hand by myself mm -hmm. uh, and I said, no, I said, we should count however we have and we'll adjust. That's the way it should be. But we should count them after the first data competition or some standard that's consistent. But no, football should be counted if you have one. If you've got 110 players, they should be counted as 110. I said, we'll adjust. It'll create more opportunities. We'll make it work. I said, but let's not artificially do this. I said, that's not right. And of course, I played football, right? So all of a sudden, they would sit with me and talk to me and that. But I'm, I'm kidding. They were great. But uh <laughs> But yeah, I'll never forget that. I was the only one. The first one I said, no, we count them all. Well, and I think that that's so, you know, that as I look at your role now coming into PSU as the athletic director less than a year ago, um, and you came in with a mandate, which I, I want to share because it was a lofty one, but not only building on athletic <laughs> success, but also developing a comprehensive strategic plan that will carry athletics at Portland State forward in a way that is both financially sustainable and in the spirit of PSU's identity as an urban research university that provides pathways to brighter futures for students of all backgrounds. You know, that one year later, as you've tried to tackle this, this, you know, this big challenge, this big mandate, um, how have you done that? And how do you, you know, 1985, you began in your administrative role and that yeah. work has prepared you for this, but I'm... Yeah, you know, it's interesting. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a big goal and, and uh, word at a time, post-COVID, where many schools have struggled financially, universities in general. And then that echoes down to the sport programs and all the other departments on campus because enrollment's down, and et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, everyone thinks of athletics in the terms of the USC's and the Washington's and the Oregon's and Oregon State's with these lofty budgets. There's 365 Division I schools, okay? 300 of us are like us. The 65 are in kind of a different situation, but we all play together, work together, have the same rules together. Uh, so, uh, it, number one, that prepared me, and I'd been at the Power Five at Washington State, which didn't have a large budget, so it's not like. And then I'd been in Nebraska, where they had a lot of money, uh, you know, resources and et cetera. But I think what prepared me is what they've asked me to do I would do anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not on the global political scale or public scale, but every year you do in each unit, okay, what's our plan this year? What do we want to do? But it's all based upon our mission and values. Great student athlete experience. We're going to do things the right way. And we're going to be compliant, NCAA, Title IX, et cetera. And then we make all our decisions based on that. Of course, the challenges, as Terry knows, you know, generating more revenue. Finances are tough right now for a while, so we're working hard on doing that. But the other thing that I did is the first thing I did is I hired uh, Cheryl Levick, uh, and she's a former uh, associate AD at Stanford, AD at Santa Clara, uh, uh, Georgia State, uh, 
very, very bright, really understands athletics to do a 360 Title IX review of our program. First thing I did, hey, how are we doing? I had a pretty good idea of most of it, but hey, I want you to take a look at it. How do I get better? Where are we deficient? And then did a review of all our programs and then did a review, okay, how do we generate more revenue? So I had all those pieces, but that was the number one thing. I wanted to know where we're at uh, and are we doing the right thing so we can build that, helping all our programs, particularly our female programs, uh, to make sure that that's built into our strategic plan to accommodate what they're hearing. The other thing I did, I did is I met with each unit, 20 units. We have 20 units in the athletic department for two hours each. Tell me about your area. Uh, tell me the positives about Portland State, the negatives. Tell me the positives about your unit and the negatives. And if you were athletic director for a day, what would you do? So I met with the, and I just listened. Because in, because I had to do a strategic plan in a short period of time, so I needed to understand in a hurry. So that helped as well. So all those things, including our Big Sky Conference strategic plan, the uh, uh, NCA steering committee, where they're looking at what does athletics look like in the future at the NCA level, which have Title IX implications, including NIL, which I believe will have Title IX implications, um, uh, et cetera. But that's how I approached it. Hey, let's see where we're at. Then we're going to build it from there and make sure that we looked at everything and pulled every stone up. Probably taking a little more time than I wanted, but I think that helps inform you so you make good decisions or at least you knew what decisions you need to make. So you can build all that together. Did anything surprise you in those conversations or really stand out to you? No, uh, uh, it didn't really surprise me, but uh, uh, during the conversations with the staff, it's how passionate they are. And relative to many of the Big Sky schools, Portland State's pretty young in the Big Sky Conference, the youngest. Sac State, Portland State were the first. Uh, is that how passionate they are uh, That and how successful we've been with maybe not the largest budget in the league. We have maybe some disadvantages, but we have wonderful advantages as well. Uh, beautiful city. Uh, we got to get through COVID. And those issues, uh, we're in the I-5 corridor, which is a recruiting hotbed for many of our sports uh, and many of our teams in our league. We're right in the, the heat. We have a chance to be really, really good. And... Uh, not that we haven't in the past, but how do we build from there? So, and and we, as our commissioner says, John, Portland State Punch is way above their weight class. You way overachieve. Uh, so we love it, right? That's it. <laughs> well, you're two years in too. How does that, like, you know, he's spoken of his strategic plan, but as a coach, you know, when you look at your, reflecting on what he's said, like, how do you look towards the future? I think it's really now. exciting. I think with, with John's leadership, but also... Um, there's a lot of things that Portland State can offer. I, we're fortunate to have facilities on campus. I know not all of our sports programs are afforded that, mm -hmm. um, but for basketball, we have a beautiful Viking pavilion right on campus, and that's been a huge advantage. Where when I first started eight years ago as an assistant, that wasn't the case. We were proud of what we had, but it's a practice gym now um, and offices, whereas before it was 1500 I mean... <laughs> Yeah, you know, and so I think that we've come a long ways, and so there's a lot to sell here. Yeah. Um, and saying that, we we still have our own challenges, and I think we continue to work um, for equality where, where we can get better at. And um, But, yeah, Portland State has a lot to offer in this city, and so I'm excited to come out of COVID and these things and, and, and find our way. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? How does it feel hearing kind of the, the – how is it to have – John is your athletic director playing at the school going into your senior year. What he's been great. <laughs> First time I met him. We need it. Right. He's been great. Um, no, yeah. Our, kind of like what Chelsea said, our facilities are phenomenal. Our staff is amazing. Um, we play off off campus, but that facility even then like is amazing. Um, even just like our locker rooms and our training rooms and our weight room is incredible. And not a lot of places can really like say, say that. So like, we just have to like be very fortunate about everything that we have and um, just keep like realizing that because it's beautiful. It's so pretty. Portland native. Oh, yeah. yeah. There we go. <laughs> Another Portland native. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, 
you know, as we come near the end of this panel, um, I think, you know, I want to take a moment thinking about where we're at with Title IX, where now 50 years after it's the passage of Title IX, one in every five girls in the United States plays sports. Um, but and and all of us have been impacted by Title IX. It's really it's transformed the landscape of of sports in general. We still, at the same time, we could improve representation um, in coaching and administration. The dropout rate for girls is two x over boys. Women's sports receives only four percent of online coverage. Um, and though consumer spend is about seventy five percent in the hands of women, commercial investment is still only zero point four percent. So huge advancements, great big things that we can work on improving. And so I ask each of you, as you look towards the future, um, you know, the next decade when we celebrate the 60th anniversary, what do you, what is top of mind for you or what do you think the priorities should be? I'd like to see the media step up um, and, and give the women athletics and uh, the women athletes and women's athletics uh, a better share of you know, TV, radio, just exposure because people want, I mean, look at the Thorns, great example. You know, they're, they're coming out and they are supporting the Portland Thorns like crazy, okay? But everybody in the city knows about the Thorns. They know when they're playing, they know when they practice, but the only time you heard about Portland State women's basketball or University of Portland women's basketball is, you know, University of Portland now made it to the NCAA tournament. Up to that point, most of the people in the city didn't have a clue how they were doing. And so you're not gonna get the community support without them knowing what's going on. Mm-hmm. And um, so I, I, I think in the area of media, which then will bring in more sponsorships, which bring in the dollars to the universities, but it's a vicious circle. Mm-hmm. You know, the sponsors come because people you know there's butts in the seats yeah <laughs> and that's what they want to see well you can't get the butts in the seats unless people know when the games are well we can publicize as much as we can but we send the information to the tv stations and to the newspapers but they're the ones that have to put it in and um you know very small example but this last sunday was the nca selection show big deal march madness right and you look at the calendar of events for what was going to be on TV and under men's basketball selection show, mm-hmm. what time, where it was, under women's basketball, wasn't even mentioned. Mm-hmm. You know, so it just sounds small, it sounds minor, mm-hmm. but but one all, each of yeah, the things sort they, of they they add, add up, up. Mm-hmm. and um, that kind of stuff is still continuing to happen, mm-hmm. and that's got to be in the next ten years the yeah. biggest change in my opinion. Yeah, and I agree with that. And I will say, since the last time I was in the Big Sky Conference 15 years ago as an athletic director, it has the streaming opportunity and technology has helped us. We have 150 games, uh, events at Portland State on, on national TV, whether being streamed or live. We didn't have that back in the day, Terry, did we? I mean, we were lucky to have one football game every two weeks. You know, we didn't have any on basketball. So men or women. So that has helped it, technology. And uh, I think that's a real positive. And I, kudos to our league for doing that. Soccer's on every, uh, every one of our soccer events at home are, are streamed. Uh, so helps you in a couple of ways. Exposure, number one. Number two, recruiting. You can recruit someone from somewhere else, mom and dad can watch you play, and your brother, and that's a big deal. Uh, I think the other thing is, as I did my strategic plan, I worked with a company locally, and I'm, you know, I've learned enough that I hire people who are a lot smarter than I am, which doesn't take much, but hired folks that understand the digital marketing, and actually, uh, our biggest upside. One, a great opportunity for us is uh, uh, basketball, volleyball, soccer, and softball. Start charging their people because Portland is loves women's sports. It's a great community for that. We need to educate our community, and that's my job. But we have opportunities to do it 
where you don't have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars buying advertising on the radio. We, we can target those people who are fans and we can zero in on them rather than the shotgun approach. So yes, you're exactly right. That happens and it drives me nuts and it happens on our campus, quite frankly. But we've made a lot of strides in that regard to create more interest. Absolutely. Shifting the way that we, as, as consumption of media shifts from the traditional model of television and a broadcast yeah. and goes to digital consumption through a variety of mechanisms, not just TVs, but tablets and so forth. Um, how do you get that information to the person who would buy in? Um, and how do you take advantage of those new inbound marketing opportunities like social media? Um, absolutely. I could not agree more. <laughs> um, how about for you, you know, the next 10 years priorities, what do you think about? Yeah. No, I think that it's been neat to even see <clears throat> last year um, some female athletes had highlighted maybe the um, inadequacies between men's facilities and women's facilities on TikTok. Yeah. Um, and so I think it came to light a lot of those things. And again, you don't want to get caught up in comparison, but I think that the reality of, of shining a light on those issues is really important. And now both men's and women's, yeah, both men's and women's uh, college basketball right now has a March Madness. Yeah trademark which is great uh there's still a lot of of ways that i would love to see the women's game rewarded um if you're winning games at the tournaments uh financially you know these are the things that i'm not in behind the scenes um but i think that again to to second john's comment about the big sky um get, getting that espn plus contract has been huge so that a lot of people can see our games and just visibility we talked about with our athletes too i think especially on the women's side get to know our stories mm -hmm. I think that there are a lot of people that are interested in watching the game and the competitiveness and the the nature of our sport, but also just with the female athletes in general um, and our student athletes, get to know them as people and their stories. And so um, even just locally, we've been trying to highlight those stories within our social media from Portland State, but also um, just within our team, because um, it's really going to be hard not to support them once you get to know them. I could, I think especially as an athlete in this space who's worked in broadcasting as well, you know, we've we've told the story of sports in a, one specific way, and that's great, but there's more ways to tell the story of sports, um, especially if you want to reach consumers and customers who and fans who want to be fans but don't even know it yet because they haven't had something that really would compel them to pay attention. And so how do you broadcast each sport in a way that it's meant to be shown, not in one model? And how do you tell the stories that will bring in new fans that maybe haven't yet? You know, what's interesting in that is at the Big Sky Tournament last week, we had our media, it was the first time I had been through what uh, results, and it talked about how many touches we had per sport, how many people watched it, et cetera, et cetera. The arbitron of digital media. Interesting, in men's and women's basketball, the average person watches a women's game 20% longer than a men's game. The The women's basketball fan actually watches longer than the male fan. And they can even, which tells me that we're, we're getting them, now we have to hook them. Right. And with the ESPN Plus, we have the ability to tell the story at, at halftime, at, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that we can program that you don't have sometimes with the national broadcast. I think that's very valuable we need to take more advantage of that, and that's one of my initiatives with the league to give us the ability to do that. Yeah, I love how technology is enabling us to let yeah. the fans speak for themselves, right, rather than assuming we know what they want. Um, and we know what some of them want, but these new technologies, this ability to track engagement actually enables us to, you know, better reach our fans and really understand um, who is tuning in, who is watching. I think the Olympics is a great example of that because they do those human human interest stories. And I know a lot of people that, believe it, I actually have friends in art and sports, um, <laughs> that love the Olympics because of the human interest stories. And then they follow them, you know, into the sport that they're, that they're participating in. Yeah. And um, so getting them to know the athletes right. is really key. And so hopefully you'll make some headway with that. Yeah. How about you next? <laughs> One more year here, so you're focused on that, but. <laughs> um, it, the media does remind me of like um, when March Madness was in the bubble and 
um, the men's team had this like fabulous weight room and then the women's team just had like these dumbbells and as well as like the women's and men's equal pay between like the U.S. women's national team and the, the men's national team. Um, all of those situations were mainly covered by media and that's how I heard of it and that's how it's kind of unfortunate that we had to get to a point where like we're screaming for help like hello do you see these issues instead of them being just blatantly obvious but I also think the media is really beneficial and I think that it's something that can help us get a message out in a really positive way and like you said when you're talking about it every five years like just keep talking about it and just keep letting people know like what title nine is and why it's so important and why people should like learn this and so yeah the media is it's really important i think we can use it to help us for when you're in an echo chamber and it's all you know you maybe think like well i guess this is just what i deserve or what i'm entitled to and when you start to have the um yeah, the reflections of, of other people, you realize, oh, maybe, maybe I should be aspiring for more. Maybe this isn't, you know, maybe is I deserve better than this. And, and then striving to make that happen. Um, I even think I was just follow up your car. I think even in, in, it's not within college athletics, but just being a mom in sport, mm. I think similarly be in that chamber of like, I don't really know, is this the expectation? How do we do this? But having open conversations about that, what that looks like, right. you know, not too much information, but you, you go coaching. Are there lactation rooms or they're not? Is that an okay thing? Yeah. You travel with children. Do you not? What does that look like? So in a sport, we talk about it and it contacts a few contacts of female athletes. But now as female head coaches or assistant coaches, what does that look like right. to support your staff in that space as well? So I think for me, those next 10 years, that's what it looks like is to learn um, how do we get better in those spaces? Yeah. It's like an explorer in a new land. I like to think of it, the positive of it, like, okay, I'm this adventurer in a new land, understanding where the challenges and limitations are. And that is my, um, you know, that then gives me the opportunity to, to you know, uh, highlight or work together to try to then make that change. Absolutely. Um, well, we have one question from the audience that I wanted to put out there before we have to close. Um, the the question is, do you think men's programs have too many resources or women's programs have too little? Um, and this is perhaps a follow-up. Should Title IX require the same amount of money to be spent on men's and women's sports? <laughs> That's a, a, a very deep question. Um, I look at that all boats should rise. Mm -hmm. So not tear down, but build up. And that's always been my approach. Um uh, and I think that's positive for the department. It's positive for our donors. It's positive for the university. W are we where we need to be? Absolutely not. Are we better than we were when I played, when I started? Absolutely, we're better. And, uh, um, um, you know, I, they're all our team. They're all the Vikings. And I want to treat them relative to the program. And every program's different, too, right? The culture of the program and the scholarship makeups are different. Etc. The assumption is every student athlete's on full scholarship. That's not the case. Only 35% are on full. The rest are equivalency sport. Mm -hmm. So they have pieces and they're working and mom and dad are helping them, et cetera, et cetera. So I like to build up. Right. Um, and again, resources are finite. Right. You love to be the 60 of the 65 of the 365 and have tons of resources yeah. building yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but I don't know. I, I like this level. <laughs> because you know what, it's uh, our athletes are playing for the love of the game, and I call this the real collegiate model mm -hmm. at our level. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe this is Americana, mm -hmm. our level, not at that level. Mm -hmm. uh, they're playing for the love of the game, and they're trying to uh, be better as people and compete. And maybe you don't have everything, but you know, by God, you know, we're going to compete and have a great experience. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's building up. Mm -hmm. um, do men have too much? relative to who, mm. right? I would rather build up to make sure everybody has whatever we can give that it's equal on both sides. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way to end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any, any other, anything yeah, else? I mean, I'd, that's obviously the, the, the right approach and the way to do it because Title IX wasn't written to, to eliminate men's sports, even though that was the fear mm. back then as, oh, that was going to be the end of football. Uh -huh. But um, it was, it was meant to give opportunities for women yeah. and, as those resources and opportunities increase, 
you don't need to tear down the men's sports to do that. Yeah. So this has been a very, very special evening. I want to thank everyone who has joined us tonight for this Title IX roundtable, especially to our guests um, sitting here with us, to our host PSU, and we're sitting in Lincoln Hall, and to the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission, whose generous support made this event possible. I'm your host, Shannon Robery, signing off with gratitude for what came before and excitement for what the future holds. So here's to the next 50 years of women's sports. They're here. Thank you. <laughs> Go bikes. <laughs> Ha! <laughs>